Uh, George Jennings is a um, researcher in uh, martial arts, sport, um, and sociology at Cardiff Metropolitan University, and I'm talking to him today. George, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing, Paul? Is yeah, I'm, I'm nice, okay. nice and sunny. It is yeah. nice and sunny today, but I've got a touch of Monday-itis, but it's nice to talk to you today about, uh, yeah. about your research, thank and you. that you're sitting in front of a Wing Chun dummy. Yeah, um, and if you want to <laughs> Yeah, I thought I'd show you the corner because this kind of represents a little bit of what I, I do. Because, yeah. yeah, my background mainly is in Wing Chun, but also I lived in Mexico, so I've got the Lucha Libre mask here. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, at the moment, I'm looking at a bit of a HEMA as well, some local research in an academy. <laughs> so it's a kind of combination of martial arts in the corner. So, uh, okay, so the background's been staged for this media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So like you that. you uh, worked and lived in Mexico, and you researched um, uh, various kinds of ostensibly indigenous but often reconstructed martial arts. And then you've moved back to the UK, and your research has moved on. Tell us a bit about the Mexico research first. Okay, sure. Yeah. So before I moved to Mexico, I didn't know that there were any. Mexican martial arts exactly. I knew obviously there was lucha libre, the form of free wrestling, with yeah. often with masks and all the characters involved. And I knew that uh, Mexico had a rich boxing heritage, with a history of great boxers. Um, but when I just encountered um, one Mexican martial art by good fortune, really, because I was in um, a cultural area of Mexico City in a, a called Cuyocan, which is a very nice place to visit, by the way. And and there was a cultural center which they had a big banner outside and it showed a, a woman in a headdress in a very low position kind of the martial looked like a martial arts position mm -hmm. and I thought wow that is that a martial arts and it said Shilam Arte Arte Marcial Mexicano or I think it was like Arte de Pelea so fighting art mm. Mexican fighting art and and it was in the place where I was actually learning a language in that cultural center um, which which was promoting indigenous things, for example, indigenous languages. So that, that's why I joined the group, really. In the first few months of living in Mexico, I found it very, very luckily. Mm -hmm. And I joined it as a, as a student, for, and I learned it for a year uh, until the branch school closed down, just because usual finance in martial arts, as we know, and issues yeah. of bureaucracy. So I, I got to know Shalan quite well, and I continued my journey through um, studying it through interviews and other, other methods as well. Yeah. yeah. So the, re the really interesting thing that one of the when I, I've read your articles um, on that project, on that time, and on that martial art, one really interesting thing about Shilam was the fact that the the people who developed it kind of knew that they were inventing it, but they were appealing imaginatively to a kind of pre-European culture, mm. but they knew they had no access to that culture really, yeah. so they sort of used various ingredients from what is known and what is imagined about that past yeah. to develop i mean what's the status of the art i mean is is it are they saying it, it would have looked a bit like this or or it's just like this is to try and imaginatively imaginatively engage with our roots what what is the status of that i would say that it was the second option that you've given me is that they're imagining or reimagining what it could be like but they, they would say the, the philosophy behind it is authentic in the sense that they're using um, mainly the Aztec, what's so called Aztec, Mexica philosophy, the central Mexico, of the underlying principles. All of the philosophy, the, the basis is the root, and then the, the techniques or expression of that, essentially, a way to develop a human being. Um, okay. but, so the external, but they, they, there is controversy because many of their techniques do resemble um, Asian martial arts. And I've just written an article about the other belong, technique of belonging. So where does the technique belong to? And can you, can you make it belong to Mexico through the philosophy, through the ritual? Yeah. So, for example, a, punch, a twist punch, turning into snake position, does that technique become more authentic because it has a link to a lot the idea of the snake and, and some of their sort of the deities? So, yeah, I would say that they're, they're, trying, they're reimagining it, but again, it was created by a, mar a martial artist with lots of experience in other martial arts. Yeah. So, but they use other things, objects, um, you know, dresses or symbols, which give an element of the, the heritage of the culture. So it's, I would say it's a blend, um, but they can never say this is what the, the, for example, the Mayans fought like or the Zapotec fought like. Yeah. They use some of the techniques they can find from pottery, um, sort of wall paintings and murals, um, okay. excavations. They, they have some evidence they have were impostures, but we don't, obviously there's only one or two pictures. We don't know how to sequence like um, maybe yeah. with Hema, there's no, um, fortunately, fight books in existence. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of like, that. It, from what you've said about it, there's a kind of creative honesty to it. 
um, but a, but a, a, um, a kind of passionate connection with an idea of a, of a past. But it's not like a kind of art that conceals its made upness, is it? So, like for instance, you know, you say that they take inspiration from from images on pottery or any engravings or artwork they found. But so, like for instance, in Taekwondo in Korea, they, there's ancient statues where they're doing things like this. So they put these moves into cat into the patterns, into the forms, and said, "Oh, you see how ancient Taekwondo is." They're not doing that. They, no. they're, they're doing something else. Yeah, because they, they, the Prime Minister still alive, Maricela Ugalde, she's now almost 70 now, so she, you know, still alive and kicking literally and teaching. Yeah. So she can't say that, you know, it comes from an ancient lineage because she created it, but she has um, done her own research, collaborated with different people of what it may have been, but also she's had a, a her guardian or, or the leader was a dance, um, pre-Hispanic dance um, captain, should we say, mm -hmm. um, who passed away. But he taught her the philosophy, not the martial arts. So she had an oral transmission from him about what the, the Aztecs and Mashita would have, how they would have seen the world. And that's her kind of heritage. And then she's done the martial arts basis of it. But she can, you know, she wouldn't say, oh, I, someone taught me Shalam, because she was the first generation. Okay. Yeah. So you, you have this interest in, I mean, you've moved to, you moved to Wales, you've moved to Cardiff, and you've moved into looking at things like HEMA, historical European martial arts. So what kind of, what kind of relationship are, are they the same sort of project as the Shilam project or is it different yeah i think i'm interested in the moment i remember when we were in um, durham you talked about having a narrative for your research and i had to think about that and i was thinking well, all my projects could be under the narrative of re um, the idea of reinvention yeah. so you're, the idea that martial arts can reinvent the person but also martial arts can be reinvented or reimagined or rediscovered so hema and Shilam have lots of similarities in that sense the hema you said definitely these these fighters existed, like Fiore, for example, in, in Italy, um, all different fencing masters, and we're recreating or re-understanding or retesting these, these martial arts. Hmm. So that, there's definitely an idea, and we can recreate our identities or ourselves as people through this. We can become a completely different person through the kind of idea of chivalric values or the ideal of knights and warriors. So they're, they're united by a sense of a warrior. So the ideal type of a warrior in Shanam is the, the Aztec, you know, G, the uh, Eagle Knight and Jaguar Knight, and this is also also used by other Mexican New Mexican martial arts developed around nineteen nineties period. There are five martial Mexican martial arts of similar kind of idea of recreating. And Hema, in a sense, they also have the idea of these great fencing masters who were mercenaries, who were duelists, who were warriors, and 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 or maybe some local heroes as well, like in Wales, William Marshall. Mm -hmm. okay, so I've got, I had a few other props up already. Sorry, actually, you know, you told me not to prepare. <laughs> So we got William Marshall, was, um, he was first Earl of Prem Pembroke, and he was like, again, not a rags to riches, but he was, we might say, middle class today, but he was a you know, second, third son of a knight. And he mm -hmm. became the regent of England, and he under the power behind four kings, allegedly. So, and this is someone who's inspired my instructor. So it's an interesting, they have their role models, they have their kind of most heroic historical figures who they look up to, and how they might live their life around these kind of people. So I think definitely they're... Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I was just thinking about you because you also I know that you are interested in researching the spread and the teaching of. So it's not just about the construction that that you're interested. You're also interested in issues in pedagogy, issues in identity, and you've also looked at your first martial art, which is Wing Chun, or your main martial art, and you've also recently started to ex to, to explore Tai Chi as well. And you always do an ethnographic study you always approach it as a student who walks in the door and you take it from there i tried to i think it, whilst you i think if, you, if the opportunity arises and i can i do um, but i also try to use some other methods if possible like um, online ethnography and be flexible with the methods like for example at the moment now we're, we're doing online interviews because of covid19 and the lockdown so my yeah. ethnographies are turned online but I do, I do like the idea of trying to get it to mix the qualitative usually i'm definitely a qualitative researcher but i use ethnography maybe narrative, life history, media analysis, various approaches to tackle this martial arts. So at yeah. the moment I'm looking at Tai Chi, but I'm also looking at the uh, podcasts, which are the, my teacher's teacher has an uh, extensive list of podcasts and, and books as well. So I try to look at some textual analysis slowly and try to get into the involved in those methods as well to yeah. understand the organization more broadly. But yeah. definitely, I think it's good to have an insider understanding, at least for a few years. But then you step back after a few years and then try to use other methods, like I did with Shalam, help me be a bit more critical and have a more global perspective on things. So you think you feel that as a, even though you, you, you don't let, you don't draw artificial boundaries around things. So you won't say, I don't do textual analysis or I won't look at a film or I won't, 
uh, you you just try to bring as much to bear as, as seems appropriate or possible given the context I think so yeah because I use it it would primarily be qualitative basically my specialism I mean potentially I might do a survey one day but because of my skills and my interests and perhaps my you know dispositions I would probably go for a qualitative approach for example Craig Owen and I are looking at Cobra Kai and so we're developing this article which is a bit of fun and it's yeah. it's nice to look at something different so I try to use any form of data possible so it could be YouTube series could be a video a podcast you know a biography of a, a night or anything could be used as data for me yeah I try to use that yeah. okay that's and so your initial publications in this area I was looking through your 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 list of publications and 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 you the the extra ingredient i guess is theory i mean you use you don't just look at things from a naive or open ended perspective you normally have a question from theory or a, or a i mean how, how do you what's your relationship with theory as well then good question um i think in the beginning is it has evolved so when i was a student say in masters phd i used theories i was i was taught yeah. Um, it often sociological theory because that's my main background sociology of sports so it'd be things like Borgia or maybe some phenomenology or mm. Weber and some of the things I used in my PhD but I started to develop from there maybe a synthesis of different theories so yeah. as on my PhD I developed the idea of shared cultivation which combines self-cultivation from the Japanese philosopher Yuasa with things from again Borgia, Giddens, Yuasa, all these kind of sorry Weber yeah. sociologists and think of how it's not just in self-cultivation but we cultivate things together Mm -hmm. So over time, I, I, though I use other people's theories, established scholars' theories, who are not necessarily writing about martial arts, mm -hmm. I'm trying to develop, slowly trying to develop, some specific theories, like we, with your journal in martial arts studies, the one about Bruce Lee and the invention of Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. I brought in the case study of Shalam and also the case study of Batitsu to look at three case studies. So I try to use case studies yeah. to build theory, and I'm trying to do that with a book I'm writing at the moment, Reinvention yeah. of Martial Arts. So, okay. Yeah. And yeah, the other thing that I know um, about your ongoing interest is that you, uh, well, one of the big strands is, is questions around health, isn't it? And martial arts in relation to health. Tell us about, tell us about your, the thing that animates that interest. Sure, I mean, at the beginning I wasn't so, again, back to the, my development and my research, I wasn't so interested in that. I suppose when you're a, a bit younger and you're in your early twenties and things, you're more interested in like, all the fighting and all the Maybe I was interested in the narratives of aging because I noticed a lot of the people talk about getting older and they have very positive stories. So, but then when I started to analyze some of my data and I wrote up a paper in 2014, 2015 about the health narratives, health philosophies, that got me interested. I realized that there are different ways of looking, interpreting, let's say, the Chinese martial arts. And you could take it from a say, Taoist or neo-Daoist perspective, you could take it from a Western scientific perspective or maybe a holistic or even new age perspective. Yeah. And that got me thinking about this is an interesting area um, in, and as martial arts studies developed as a field, I thought, well, there is an area where we could develop more research because it's obviously a massive thing in society and in the world is the health and well-being and it's becoming more prominent in my area in sports science and exercise yeah. science. So I started to write a few more things about the, the diversity of technique and diversity of methodologies we have in martial arts that could be explored, not just for fighting yeah. and maybe looking at you know, methodology, but also how we can develop a more rounded set of movements for health and well-being and now i'm looking at martial arts i'm interested in martial arts and, and therapy and then you, know, you are also um and different forms of therapy and hopefully there's a new project called fighting in spirits which is um with a, a psychotherapist named stephen thomas who's based in cardiff and bristol mm -hmm. and he's looking at the union between psychotherapy and counseling and martial arts through some workshops so i was very lucky to again very lucky to encounter him through your uh, facebook group actually Okay. And then, yeah, so luckily that's a new project that's underway. Um, okay. So just, uh, I mean, you know, in, in, in a general sense, do you think there's, there are, um, do you think there's one specific generalizable thing that martial arts bring to health or a range of different specific things that, that people couldn't get from something else? Is it something about martial arts as a, as a thing that you do that that has a unique relationship yeah. to health or is it a general thing yeah i think very, yeah you could look at different planes if you looked at i don't want to divide mind and body but if you want to just just simplicity sake say look at you're looking at health more in a biomedical perspective i think martial arts have a, um, a variety of interesting movements so you've got things like punches kicks knees throws rolls and obviously if you look at the, the global idea of what martial arts can be like wrestling and weapons 
you've got lots of things like the gripping techniques and the warm-ups even the warm-ups you take the diversity say tai chi and then interesting warm-ups that they have hmm. that's that's something that you can explore for research and you know, i think the, the older people can do it or different people maybe someone in a wheelchair can adapt some of these techniques and so yeah. they're very adaptable i think as we've seen they've adapted for different purposes politically culturally yeah. Um, and then you've got the idea of maybe the psychological, emotional element, which links to that physicality, of course, um, which is fighting the spirit is looking at is some people have talked about the idea of it re not removes fear, but it works with fear and it works with confidence and your self concept and, and the development through that. So, you, you know, your posture and, and standing straight, keeping your shoulders back and all yeah. these things you, you know, carry yourself. And I think yeah. that martial arts definitely focuses on that internally, a lot of the aspects of yourself, like your tension and things, maybe sport, you wouldn't think about too much because you're, Think in rugby, for example, you think about getting the ball, trying to go around, and you're probably not thinking about how your shoulder feels or how your scapula feels and, hmm. and your feet ground on the floor. So martial arts goes very deep into human movement and embodiment, I think. Okay, it's an interesting thing because I was um, talking to a guy, I, I, basically a joiner, right? I, needed some, I need some joinery doing. So a joiner came around. And I was wearing a jiu-jitsu t-shirt. So we start talking about martial arts, right? And he was saying, oh, back in 2004 or something, 2007, him and his friends, they'd all been training in MMA and they all did an, did, took part in an MMA competition. And, and then he was doing competitive jiu-jitsu, but then he got really injured. And then he said, but now, he said, now I've just moved away from that. I just do martial arts. So he does like, he does Wing Chun uh, and he's tried. And I, so he made a distinction in his head between the combat sports mm -hmm. So even jiu-jitsu for him was competitive. It was a combat sport. And then he has another concept of martial arts. Uh, when he was, t he was talking about posture and he was talking about how he really enjoys the, the sort of the energy training. He was demonstrating stuff like and he kind of thrusts and he kind of bounce people away. And so I guess in terms of what you're saying is that maybe even people in competitive MMA, maybe even competitive judo or jiu-jitsu, they're just not... It, the practice is differently orientated to someone who's doing Tai Chi or Wing Chun in a certain way because it's all about your posture has to be like this and feel the tension, relax that tension, get the... Do you think yeah. that that's an active distinction or is that one that we've just made up here and now? Yeah, I think it's, it's been around for a, a while. I mean, um, you probably remember the review that Alex Chan and I wrote and we have tried to develop... I mean, maybe we shouldn't use definition because that's contentious, but just say what we're we looking at, what kind of, what fields do we look at, what areas. And hmm. I meant we mentioned combat sports, martial arts and self-defense or military yeah. systems. And often you can use that trialectic and definition or, or you might have others like we named Six Vestler and other people have, have developed di different frameworks. But generally you could argue there is a difference, but of course they, they fluctuate. So Wing Chun, for example, could be a very internal approach. And, and that's there's a kind of almost a renaissance of Wing Chun in the sense that they're looking into, is it internal martial art like Tai Chi? Is it about standing for long, many hours and understanding your body? And that, there's an argument towards that. And other people have turned it into competition and semi-contact approach. And others have just gone for the street fighting, real, realistic approach, realistic, you know, reality in the streets. Um, and I think that any martial art can be moved around that. So maybe judo you know, can be also be a therapy and you start to look at, I know that in Spain they have a, a therapy called adapted utilitarian judo where they're using it for many elderly people to learn how to grip yeah. the fall. So judo, again, from a dynamic Olympic sport that it is, can go back almost or a different direct, slightly different direction mm. for yeah. health and well-being. So I believe, yes, there are different, different dimensions in martial art, but maybe not, you can't necessarily say one martial art has to be this because it will probably change over time. Yeah. Direction. I mean, I do. I, I often want because I agree with that. I agree entirely with that perspective that you, you see how people are using a term, and you see. So, like in the case of my joiner, um, he he has a concept. Like, there's an absolute world of difference for him between the combat sport uh, and the martial art that he's doing now. So, I'm always interested in the way people use terms because I would never, in my head, in my Venn diagram, MMA mixed martial art right it's a martial yeah. art right um but other people other people don't i wonder if where where lines would be drawn between you know because i was just thinking could you could mma be transformed into like a healthful practice and then my my own answer is well of course it can like yeah. because the boxing the kicking the stretching yeah. the aerobic of course that that could be boxer size that can be kickboxer size i mean why wouldn't it be but 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 then it's then it's no longer wouldn't fall into the category martial or maybe it would maybe that would make it even more into the category of 
yeah. of martial art because the category of martial art slips around in people's heads mm. as well, doesn't it? I mean, that's... Yeah. Interesting. One interesting paper is that by... I don't know if you've seen the paper by um, Irina Martinkova and Jim Parry, and they have a paper of uh, martial categories. Okay. Like classification and uh, clarification. Like that. So they've got seven, I think seven categories. They sort of martial sports, martial games, for example, which you yeah. might be on horses and playing. Yeah. And yeah. Martial therapies. And there's lots of different categories. So maybe, but we use martial arts, we know from your research about, you know, it's something that came up in the 1980s, 1990s when people stopped saying karate, they start to say martial arts more generically. Hmm. Um, and we have that now in our discourse, don't we? So it, it's going to be used by the public. It's going to be used by specialists and scientists and then um, we probably won't be able to lose it even if we write nice papers or frameworks it's, it'll take a long time to use more specific words yeah. um, but i think you would look at instead of martial art look at the word art and i think that there's a link there's a there's a definition there because we've got art like painting and poetry and hopefully you'll get better as you get older and you're cultivating yourself you're developing something to transmit it for the next generation maybe you could argue that some of the combat sports although they can be beautiful and aesthetic there's a damage to the person through, for example, boxing. If I carry on doing boxing all my life, yeah. sadly I'll, I'll get brain damage, no doubt, or I'll give someone else brain damage. Yeah. Um, and that it hinders, but hopefully art doesn't damage you. Yeah. You can sustain it to your 80s and 90s. So yeah. I'd argue there's an element of longevity there in art. So you think that the, yeah. the, the, the term, the, the element in the, in the, in the couple of martial art, do you think that the, the, t the term art is the is a really distinctive feature that will always be there. So you might be doing combat sports, you might be a boxer, but you could then kind of graduate or, or retire from that, but still love the art and the feel and the yeah uh, yeah yeah definitely it's, a, it's the feeling and expression and um, maybe you're being creative as well with it. And of course, you know, combat sports are going to be creative as well because they're creating new techniques and new strategies. And I think that's why um, the, the martial arts change so quickly as well. It's an art because they wing show my martial art. You see the diversity, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Say so you just the Ip Man lineage who died in 1972, Bruce Lee's teacher. Yeah. You know, how many, there's so many different interpretations of what he taught and how the technique should be done and the drills. And, and there's a lot of creativity. And, and that, obviously that changes over time. My teacher's changed dramatically since I first joined him when I was 18. Hmm. And then when I came to university. So it's quite yeah. impressive. I guess the, the theme of creativity is an interesting one because some martial arts embrace creativity. Like in, in, in say Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it's like, if you can invent a new thing that works, people are like, wow, that's amazing. But in, I, I was talking to a very senior Aikido instructor. I won't mention any names because they might not want me to, to mention their names. And I, and I asked about the status of change or innovation in Aikido and he kind of went, oh yeah. He said, because like, for instance, in, in, in formal Aikido, there is no rear naked choke. There's, there's, it just isn't in Aikido. Mm. But it exists and it's popular now. So, and you're saying, you saying, I guess a real traditional teacher would say there'll be a certain type of hold in Aikido that they would say, well, you could then, that, that could become. But he said, it's very, they, they, they have a really resistant uh, relationship to creativity in it. So like Aikido's at one end, uh, and whereas in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at the other, I mean, where do we put, put things like HEMA, which we might regard as quite creative, but within their own field, they'll go, no, no, it's not creative. It's discovery, right? Mm -hmm. I'm discovering the medieval way of using this cudgel or battle axe or something. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the states of creativity across these different mm -hmm. sorts of practice that you've looked at? Yeah, I think it will vary within, again, within the schools of the particular martial arts. So. We look at HEMA, some may be very much like, try to take a purist, traditionist approach, like this is how this person, you know, Tal Hoffer, or whoever it is, or Vardy, or this fencing master said, and this is the only thing we teach, and we're not gonna guess between the lines, but mm. others will critique, well, look at medieval art or Renaissance, or even early Renaissance art, it's like, in these books, not like the greatest paintings, but mm. sometimes their, their anatomy and other things is it's a bit vague, and it's not so easy to find what, what between this point and this point, or when they they let go of their blade, what happened? How do they get around their arm and yeah. and then start to feed things between the lines? And you've got also you've got to look, step back and look at the person behind this doing it. Normally, the people doing these martial arts typically have some kind of background. So they might come from a fencing background. They might come from a boxing background. So my instructor in Hima, for example, he's done boxing since he was a kid, then kung fu, tai chi, and he's done then um, sport fencing as well. Mm -hmm. And he's gone and Krav Maga as well. So a lot of it, I think we fill the gaps to take that and to use some Krav Maga. 
Yeah. Like, well, you might do some boxing, he knows how to punch well. And one of our students does ninjutsu, so we, we sometimes we, we share practice of how to fall safely, for example, yeah. in, in practice. So others, you know, using not just his instructor, but his colleagues and trusted friends come in to give special sessions of how to, how to roll, how to, when we're doing these takedowns with a dagger. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a shared creativity in a sense that we're, we're blending, learning from other people's knowledge to fill these gaps from this manuscript, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So I, think, I don't know if that answers your, your question. No, I think, I, think it, I, think that, so I think that people who, it's, although we might look at something and go, well, that's HEMA, and then we might form a stereotypical opinion of what HEMA might think it is. For practitioners, it's often just a framework within which they explore their own ability to use a certain weapon or do a certain technique. It's not like, it's not one thing for everyone, is it? It gets a certain yeah. reputation and we might go, oh, how can you, how can you access the way that a, that a group of people might train in the middle ages when we have such limited evidence left and limited media. Uh, but it, people don't involved in it, don't really care. They're like, oh, I like that sword. How would I use it? What does the, what do the textbooks say? But this feels like I would do this with it. Do you think? Yeah, I think definitely there's an idea of exploration, but then they also, they, you have your personal exploration, but it's always tested against someone else because HEMA is, is a pedagogy, back to the other pedagogy, that's primarily uh, sparring based, which is not, it's not based on kata or forms. They, they have, um, you know, the cuts like one, two, they might have numbered them one to 10 and they may have uh, interesting names for them. But generally, yeah. I, I find at least a third of the class is sparring and they also have now competitions. There is an element of combat sport now. Yeah. becoming grow, a growing sport and yeah. they have the workshops where they go to Ireland or other, other countries where they exchange and give each other guest workshops so there's yeah. always going to be like questions and it's very open pedagogy where they say actually I'm not sure if I agree with that and you know, right. you know instead of like, you probably wouldn't like these kind of very yeah. traditional parts you don't question the teacher and it's very informal pedagogy where you use the first name basis they call yeah. Marshall maybe the teacher but you don't usually say this is the first name so Enjoy. um so what do your so you work in a kind of sociology sports um, department and yeah. school? What um, what do your colleagues make of your interests and what's kind of how do you just do you, do you need to justify your activities or are they totally behind you? Do they kind of go yeah, it makes sense or how does yeah. it work? I think I'm quite lucky, really. I mean, then our school is a, now it's all the sports and health sciences. It's a really big school now, almost a faculty because we've got another campus where they do laboratory work on tissues and cells and all that kind of really biological stuff and you go to my school which they got you know, biomechanics of I know, trampolining or all sorts of things going on and coaching research and so I'm in the sociology and ethics kind of area and we would have fit around different programs so I think they're happy because I'm, I'm writing quite a bit for the university and, and developing research and scholarly activity so I think no one's question only one colleague wants a lunch said, is that you know martial arts is that a bit niche that's only only kind of negative He's again a physiologist and health and that kind of thing. But that's the only, I've been quite lucky. I think now we're, we're fortunate to be in a time where martial arts is a cool area. It's getting funding, it's getting recognition. And, and I, most people say, oh, that's interesting. And they know it's a, people say, oh, it's quite cool. They, they think it's quite different okay. and original. So and is there anything that you've been able to take back to uh, a wider um, sociology of sport kind of audience about for instance pedagogy or about power dynamics or politics or gender or or anything like that is there anything that that you feel that research in martial arts gives a unique um, window into sure I mean recently I went to the conference in Worcester uh, last year which was about coaching so it was a cluster for research in coaching crick conference and they kindly invited me to give to run a seminar so, so I, that was a um, in an afternoon where I invited some other colleagues like Lynn Jeku, for example, Simon Dodd, um, Lorenzo Pedrini and his boxing coach. So we had different uh, sports or martial arts. We've got boxing, we've got you know, Japanese or Okinawan martial arts. We have um, more the Japanese Shudokan tradition. And I was looking at Hima. So we're looking at, and also we had uh, Jean-Francois Laucher looking at oh, yeah, uh, yeah. wrestling. Yeah. So we've got a lot of very international, you see martial arts are international, they're multicultural, intercultural. And there's a great diversity of that. And we were looking at inclusivity. So as a topic, inclusive for the topic of the conference. So I said, that, for example, HEMA, that we now have the inclusivity of um, left-handers are now able to do it. Because in, in medieval times, it was like the devil. You know? Okay. So, yeah. So that, you know, and women also are allowed to do these things. So that's, in, that's interesting. Like you would look at previously outlawed kind of practices and now being included in the 21st century. So that was, that was a theme they seemed quite interested in. And we might have a special issue of their journal coming up next year, maybe. 
Mm-hmm. So I think they are sports are interested in martial arts more more than ever. Really, we see lots of history journals now. They've got special issues on masculinity and martial sports, and, mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. very more than ever. When I first started, it was like really obscure. I think a lot of people think, "Well, this is very esoteric." Like once someone said to me, "My PhD," <laughs> but now it's when they're seeing that we've got lots to offer them. Yeah. yeah okay so what's uh what what's next on your agenda i mean we're all in various forms of lockdown um in different ways and it's caused problems for our research and our teaching and our writing sometimes what what what, what's going to happen with you over the next few months or year or so and your research Ooh, okay for the moment um because i can't do my face-to-face ethnography i'm doing it's obviously switched online so i'm taking notes about the martial arts under the lockdown so it's really interesting seeing things that we have a on the HEMA group, we have a film night every week where we watch a, a rubbish film over Zoom and make jokes about it. And so that's the social aspect of HEMA. And then we've got um, Friday, we have a workout and hit session, so high intensity workout, with one of the students runs that one. Okay. So we have loads of things going on. But my own Wing Chun group are now back in contact with them online. So I'm getting lectures from my teacher and I'm taking loads of notes. So mm. that, my training wise and observation, is it, a really interesting time. Um, mm. See how groups are being very different, they're very creative, being creative again in moments of crisis. Mm-hmm. That's ongoing. Um, I'm trying to write the monograph slowly about the reinvention of the martial arts in the West. I, obviously inspired by some of the Eastern practices, mm-hmm. um, which is in, in the series um, published by um, Professor Jay Mangum, so mm-hmm. the historian of sports. So slowly, I'm, I've got one chapter ready on um, martial arts therapies, and I'm also now looking at martial arts and self-help. Yeah, self-help books, as you know, people like Jeff Thompson, which I know you're interested in as well. <laughs> I got people ready, but you know these kind of interesting characters like Warrior. And I've got you know that's what I'm writing about next. My next chapter is going to be like the intelligent warrior. Is that is that Warriors. Jeff Thompson? Is it? This one's what Jeff Thompson's Warrior. Is that one. quite new? Is it? It's 2010, I think. So fairly okay. new. Those are the recent ones. But again, it's quite it changed. You know, a bit more spiritual. Uh, a really bit cool. more spiritual, would you say? I would say. Uh, well, I, I don't know the man, but in terms of the outputs that I've seen, I mean, he you know yeah. when, when he renounced violence, he seemed to embrace a kind of strange spirituality and psychology that yeah. I don't I have no stomach for that so so well done you for being for being able to, to yeah I, I finished it but it was a laugh I don't want to be rude to Jeff Thompson but it made me laugh a few times I told my partner you've got to read this and it's quite sexist in some parts I mean first few pages so this book is for men women could also read this and it's like oh thank, and my, my, my partner's like oh thank you for allowing me to be a warrior she said next day <laughs> so there's a lot of things needs to be critiqued who say and this yeah. one is quite Look, I wonder with with I think it's it's interesting the way that I mean again I, I I loved Jeff Thompson's early works I mean he was hugely influential on me as a as mm. as a martial artist as someone who was interested in really being able to use techniques in 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 tense situations dangerous mm. situations and then when I looked into to his change from when he when he sort of renounced violence I, I, and to me it just became um unwatchable unlistenable unreadable because because it 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 seemed to be a little bit messiah complex now i don't know anything about that but i wonder if you can take the the recent stuff and look back and see if if there's any continuity there or if it's just like a radical change of status i don't know interesting look at that i mean my phd i looked at the ideal types of the the fighter the martial artist and the thinker which i find that in the chinese martial arts they were it's over their life history they seem to have this kind of formation okay. but i think over time you look over decades people often start maybe more as a fighter become more technical over time and become maybe traditionalist and they want to pass on their knowledge and and then they may become later in life a bit more we could say in the bracket spiritual philosophical or you know, but that that spiritual philosophical is also very fungible. I mean, if, uh, yeah. some of the stuff that I've looked at are figures like Jeff Thompson, I guess, when they get older and they really don't want to be involved in violence anymore, and they've been deeply traumatized throughout their entire lives by things that they thought they embraced wholeheartedly. And you look, and it's like, well, they've obviously thought, well, how can I get an income from something that I can't do anymore? And I think Jeff Thompson was offering like to go on walks with people, like you could pay him, you'll go for a walk and he'll share his philosophy. With you. It's yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Barrel, bottom, scraper, like <laughs> that's what God. I, you know, I don't want to bad mouth someone who who I haven't studied and I don't know, but but it, it struck me that the spiritual seems a little bit, or the managerial seems a little bit too close to the. Uh, how can I make some more money out of this? 
Yeah, I think there's an element there that I think I've missed in my previous research is the, the money and, and the business side. I mean, I'm looking at maybe people's embodiment, their experience and yeah. lots of other things. But definitely you can see there's an element of creating a business and why many martial arts fail, like say Bartitsu, you look at why, also you can study why martial arts collapse or why institutions fail or why they struggle to get students. That's an interesting yeah. study in itself. But at the same time, some people come, they work very much in the neoliberal. He, in this book very much is about like, you know, Jag, everyone should have a Jaguar XR and you, you see God better. He actually said, you see God better from a Jaguar XR. <laughs> but honestly, and money is God because money is an expression of energy, transformation of energy. Oh, God, oh no, no, don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, honestly, no. yeah. The money is God and things like that. Oh. <laughs> so I want you to keep speaking, but I also don't want to hear this. I don't want this yeah. to be true. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Again, I feel bad. I don't want to like be on YouTube talking about no, yeah, uh, this but is... I, I, but some are some really good. Every book, I think there are good things and there are things to critique. And sometimes there are books I'm obviously able to critique, yeah, um, and because someone's making a great business out of it. Um, whereas some people, scholars are the other one, he's written just one book, and I think he seems to live on the intelligent warrior. Again, it has very bold claims, but it seems yeah. that he focused on that and not try to write dozens of books and yeah. making money. So, you yeah, definitely. It's a fascinating thing being a martial arts entrepreneur. You can think, how can you yeah. make a living out of martial arts? Just teaching yeah. is very. I mean, I think that a lot of um, you know, I never thought about the kind of stuff that we do as scholars, academic, like professional, paid academics, um, credentialed academics, and and the kind of negative challenge we are um, um, leveling to these. On, in, in entrepreneurs because like we bust the myths we go no that's not the history and yeah. and and people who want to occupy positions of what like you say like the thinker like they want to be a mystical wise uh buddhist or taoist sage and we're going this is just cultural fantasy you're just making this stuff up like uh, where we, we we're really probably quite inadvertently and accidentally hostile to to the to the era of publications and era of figures that preceded us yes you know we're damaging people's incomes could be yeah you could think about that you can think that martial arts studies is you know it's critical it's theoretical it's got a robust amount of information behind it in research and a body of knowledge that challenges this kind of a um, singular body of knowledge of individuals isn't it and, mm. and they could potentially impact their livelihood and i mean mm. hopefully you know that could be good in there are charlatans that we know in martial arts there are a lot of charlatans who like have special powers or they can transform yeah. and perhaps they also abuse their power back to the idea of the coach or instructor who can be quite abusive to their students and and you talk about things like the muck dojo i mean i gave a presentation a while back about that linking to the end of muck mindfulness of so stephen stanley organized yeah. the university and i think muck dojo is a fascinating thing to explore that yeah there are they do have these muck senseis who really are <laughs> claim to be a master of 10 different martial arts created their own and yeah. often abuse their power and make a lot of money out of doing giving very little so that's something we could definitely possibly need to, to explore it academically um, yeah definitely yeah. definitely yeah definitely well 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 done you for being able to have the stomach to 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 look at these self-help texts i mean it's something that i feel drawn to and repulsed by uh, in equal measure <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> yeah because paul you're very it's interesting you're, you're very sad do you think that it's also the theories you have are making you quite sensitive to like deconstruction for example that maybe you make you feel repulsed by it. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think I I I'm I, I'm fearful of um, things. People who occupy straightforward positions that should be deconstructed, like like someone who wants to put themselves in the position of the wise man, someone who wants to put themselves in the position of the of the the, the physical manifestation of like an ancient lineage, mm. like you know that I I I. I I, it makes me tense and it makes me, I don't believe them. I don't trust them. I, I don't believe experts. I don't trust them. I don't believe authorities. I believe in like academic methods and critical interrogation of things. So yeah, I, I, I worry about people who claim to offer something unique or, or I even worry about, I mean, I struggle even reading like straightforward, you know, Western established philosophy because all of this seem to be jumbling in terms and concepts from anywhere. And it makes me, it makes me feel quite hostile. Like you need, what we need is to interrogate the concepts that we have 
rather than to start pulling new concepts out of the air. Mm. I, I really, I really feel hostile towards stuff like that. Okay. Interesting. So it might be because you're, you're looking at a deconstruction and I'm, maybe I'm trying to look at the reconstruction of those crossover. Yeah. And uh, I'm critical, but maybe not to that degree, because I'm still trying to understand and appreciate and interrogate and experience it myself yeah. with a hint of critique, obviously, but not to the degree. So it might be just our different backgrounds. I think, I, I, think, yeah. I think for me, it's just, it's like the personal gets in front of the, my, my personal responses to, to things that I, I've already, I already, like a pre-critical bias. Like, you know, you do the unconscious bias thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, on the one hand, I know that, the self-help discourse and, and the spiritual and a spiritualish kind of a, uh, a discourse, it exists in the world and I want to look at it, but when I look at it, it annoys me so much mm. that I can get past it, but in a conversation like this with you, I can't, I find it immensely difficult to um, treat it with any kind of respect. I you know it's like but but the the writing the reading and writing part of me that is the profession the professional academic the scholar who can really kind of uh, look at things uh, calmly uh, I can get past it but I find that I, I can't when I'm speaking about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's the unprofessional part of me yeah. that's, that's that's the boy from Newcastle you know. <laughs> It's good. Yeah, I find some of them, they do have nuggets. I think every book has some good things. Like some of them maybe reflect on if I'm trying to have like a mid-afternoon cake too often and coffee. So it's sometimes the other one, The Intelligent Warrior, which is a good one, it, it talks about like, oh, I deserve this. I deserve, I've worked hard. So I deserve the peak in energy. And it made me reflect. I do have a tendency to like, oh, I, I deserve a well. I, I live in Wales. Like, I get a bar of grief or a Welsh cake and a tea. And I start to get this, these habits, which can obviously be bad in my health in the long term. So it has been, some of them have been really useful for me to reflect on my own practice. Yeah, I mean, I admit, I do, I do draw on platitudes, right? So like one of my, I never thought that I liked it, but one that I've recently started to say to myself, if I'm confronted with a physical pragmatic problem, like how to build a grappling dummy or how to set up a new piece of training equipment because I can't get out of my own garden. And I was, I'm remembering the Bruce Lee phrase, you know, the, the salute, it's, it, the answer is simply to simplify, simply to simplify. So the first grappling dummy that I made had arms and legs and, and in the end that I've simplified it to what do I need this to do? I need to be able to punch it and I need to be able to throw it. So it's now incredibly simple. So yeah, I mean, I use the self-help, I use the platitudes, but um, it's almost like embarrassing to say it out loud. But in my head, Bruce Lee, I'm looking at a problem, I'm going to, how, because my tendency is to overcomplicate. Uh, and I go, no, I need to, what's the simplest way that I can do this? And I do find that that is a transferable platitude that I have used in constructing training equipment to, to, to carrying out domestic chores around the house, you know. So I'm a hypocrite, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. I think we, we are critical things. We, because we are humans and we are practitioners ourselves. We do things that, maybe we critique we observe another people like the humor maybe shouldn't i should i have tell that joke because often say humor in martial arts we do tell jokes with the lads or any like, and you yeah. but you might write some of these down in your great notes you think actually i think i've been involved in laughing about those things so, yeah yeah uh, it's it's yeah. yes yes i mean yeah a number of times i walk out of a lecture and I've been lecturing to like 150 undergraduate students and I've said something that I found hilarious. And then yeah. you think, oh my God, oh my God, <laughs> how am I going to get sued? But it was a joke. <laughs> yeah. And you start to, you have to really interrogate the ethics and the, and was this a malicious joke? Do I really hate the target? You know, like, yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a minefield. It's a minefield, but. <laughs> <laughs> so. I like it. Yeah, so George, um, we've talked for um, about 50 minutes now. I don't want to, like a seminar, I don't like these things to last longer than I would expect mm -hmm. students to concentrate for. But I just want to say that it's been really, really nice talking to you, really interesting yeah. as ever. Thank um, and thank you for taking the time. That's a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks for listening, everybody. Take care. <laughs> Cheers.